All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you are all doing well. I've got a uh, to quote from Warren McIntyre. I've got a great stream with a great guest I think you're really going to like. Uh, today, I am joined by illegitimate scholar, uh, one of the uh, premier cultural anthropologists in this sort of area. When you look at the academic side of things, sort of, I guess what you could say on the right, uh, it's always good to have people that are actually doing the work to study these things, to look into the actual history and truth and not sort of the uh, orthodox um, pedagogy we see in today's academia. So, uh, Mr. Scholar, welcome. Hello. Hi. Um, is, is that audio problem coming from me, by the way? I don't know if you're hearing that. I'm not hearing anything, so I think we're I think we're good okay. to go. All right. Well, if the chat says nothing, then there's <laughs> nothing. Um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. I, uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, and I think it's especially important in something like cultural anthropology, which or in anthropology in general, which is, um, if you're familiar with it at all, is an extraordinarily left wing field. Uh, it's, it's where a lot of the stuff, sociology, um, anthropology, all the social science, that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. That's where a lot of the root of critical race theory and things like that, where they come from. Okay, there is something wrong with my audio. I apologize. Okay, we can fix that. Um, but no, I mean, one of the reasons I, I listened to your to your show that you had on with Stone Age Herbalism, which I quite appreciated uh, in that respect, because I, I think that when we look at things, we, we tend to put our, say, political goggles on first and then rather, say, go out of the blue and just go from there and maybe not look at what the literature has to offer. Because so much, I think, of our modern academic problems are relatively recent in, in contemporary history. I, I, so much of our cultural aberrations, our sort of political revolutions, they really are a more 20th century phenomenon, um, more so than there are... Uh, these long arcs of history, not to say that there isn't mechanical causality to it, but I, I think it really is important for people to consider, oh yeah, so much of this did really change, you know, during the 1940s and afterwards, but um, you, you should be good to go there, hopefully with the uh, audio now. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I've just got to, um, I've got to switch this around for a second, I'm so sorry. That's fine. I can keep us entertained for just a little bit right here, but um if anything, we'll just edit this right out when we're done after the show. But while he works on that, I'm going to keep him in the background for a while while we do this. Um, so while he's fixing that, we'll uh, just stay on the air. Everything is... Uh, technical difficulties happen to us all, ladies and gents. So I don't really hope that you're all uh, too worried. But in the meantime, I certainly do hope that when we consider, say, our, our history of things, we sort of are beginning to appreciate... Um, a really big problem in academia, and this is why I find the legitimate scholar or Mr. Uh, Alaric, who writes, who runs and writes the distant view, that as the West gets more and more culturally and academically anti-white, more stagnant, that uh, I, I think is a really big issue. Because once that gets replaced, you're going to have all sorts of people come in with their sort of decolonialist takes, their argumentation about well, actually, you know, most of the West's history is Indian or most of the West's history is African. And you're going to get a lot more of those kind of problems. But hopefully uh, we shouldn't be having any issues on speakers, but um, maybe it's my fault. How about now? That th <laughs> if the audio issue is mine, I sincerely apologize. Mine? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I guess no. how's it doing now? It may have been mine. Static is mostly gone. Okay. Uh, oh, great. No, yeah. it, it's got to be me because this is a brand new setup. It was working fine until we went live, though. So it's got to be some sort of internet thing. Oh, great. Well, um, Jesus Christ, it's been five minutes. That's okay. That's <laughs> shit we can edit out and post. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. It's not that... I I don't want you to think I wasn't taking this seriously or prepared. Oh, no, you're, you're perfectly fine. I... Uh... <laughs> I've had more issues trying to like I this is why I like StreamYard more than I like streaming from OBS because I never have problems and every time I stream from OBS it goes to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, um, I mean it's complicated. Um Yeah, not not my uh I am I am I have a grug brain when it comes to tech, so that's the the case there. I, I've been learning a lot of it recently. Um <laughs> it's been a lot. But yeah, you were you were talking about unfortunately I didn't hear a lot 
Well, I, just, just, just in brief, um, and then I'll let you introduce yourself, is, is that, you know, a lot of our, our academic problems, I think, are really a, a sort of 20th century cultural aberration. I think Stone Age Herbalist had said it best that a lot of this is post-war to where we have a, a pedagogy that is runs in the absolute opposite direction of all prior academic coursework. Even the greats that we still rely on, most of those people would call them racist or bigoted or whatever. And so we're kind of finding ourselves in a position where cultural anthropology is going to probably be rewritten by anti-white political agitators rather than those that wish to take a more objective or actually look at the literature of the past. And instead, they have their political blinders on. And I thought Stone Age Herbalist in his conversation with you had a had a good point. Yeah, he definitely did. And, you know, there's always shifting over time differences culturally informed in the way that scholarship is handled within different cultures. Of course, there were different schools in uh, China and were for a long time. There were different schools in uh, Persia. Certain At a certain point, they start recognizing them as universities, but it's not like there was a black and white shift. It was a gradual shift over time to where places were recognized as universities. And prior to that, prior to Islamic and European universities, we're talking about knowledge being generated in, in monasteries and other religious institutions. So any sort of um, any sort of form of scholarship is always within its cultural context and it will always change over time. Uh, that being said, there, there's, there seems to be some non-arbitrary differences in the post-World War II um, uh, social sciences, especially anthropology, where it, it's exactly what you're talking about. It's this, uh, it's this anti-white, anti-Western, in in-group, uh, out-group bias uh, mixed up to to most of human history, and and that's the way we see it manifested in our culture today. But it's what what I also see off of that is a difference in the way that scholarship is treated like even in the past few decades because you know like i start this anthropology podcast and almost immediately i have more listeners than i would ever reach in a college classroom whereas you know you go through you get a phd yes you probably have more influence on the people that are taking your course than i do over the average listener but it like what's the ratio of of what to what with who is affecting the culture the most with their ideas and it's a difference in the way that um, it's a difference in the way that the people who are popular and whose ideas are being shared, uh, how they're evaluated. Because for most of human history, uh, and this is a very, I mean, the person who would be chosen to be up on a pedestal speaking, whether it be a preacher or a scholar, would be usually somebody who was chosen by some sort of social construct, some sort of university, some sort of government um, church. But in our case, and with anybody who has an online platform, it's just based on who wants to listen to you. And I think that that's a huge non-arbitrary difference. And I think with the falling trust in institutions in the West broadly, and specifically loss of trust in the universities, because they are doing what you're saying, and they're against learning and against um, egalitarianism in the way that I understand it in the traditional sense, that you are going to see different forms like ours being more respected. Um, and that's a really long winded way to say that, but I, I think I made my point. Yeah, no, I, I think that when you look at the, those who cover history or those that are, I mean, I think more people have listened to, for instance, I mean, before Dan Carlin kind of got his brain broken by Trump, uh, I think that, uh, you had, you know, more people listen to Dan Car Carlin's hardcore history than, you know, the average college professor on a specific historical subject would ever be read in his entire life. I have streams on, you know, the open door policy and the Monroe Doctrine that have more views than most colleges' YouTube channels have on those particular issues. However, you know, despite the disintermediation of, say, the internet or you know, the, the professorship not having as much of a, a voice that has the, you know, control over what the official narrative is, they're the ones that still operate the institutions of power. And so that dogma is still going to be there for quite some time. But you, you when did you, let, let, before we get any further into it, um, why don't you introduce yourself, just say who you are, when did you start doing your work, and why you, you know, focus so much on cultural anthropology? Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm Samuel Urban. Uh, I do Illegitimate Scholar, Weekly Cultural Anthropology, 
Dissident Cultural Anthropology Podcast. Uh, I do some other stuff as well, but that is the main thing, the thing I care about the most. On Twitter, ill underscore scholar. Um, and I, I, at 18, graduated high school. I moved around quite a bit when I was younger, including living in Asia for two years, which was huge in my personal development. Um, and I've talked about that at length in one specific story about the, the Cambodian genocide. Um, that had a big influence on my life, learning about that at a young age. But 18, I joined the US Marine Corps. 22, I got out and I started going to college um, to be a history teacher. And I did get certified to teach history. I finished my, or to teach social studies rather. Um, I finished my student teaching and I got certified and I was doing my master's degree. I quit the master's degree and started doing the podcast full-time instead. And that was because of a number of issues I saw in the education school. But I, I ended up getting, I just, just really liked school and taking classes. So I graduated, uh, paid for by the GI Bill with degrees, uh, bachelor's degrees, BAs in history and anthropology, and then a BS in education curriculum. All right, triple degrees, way to go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I just, I like the classes, they pay you a stipend, but, but really the, um, to get into why anthropology, I, I usually just tell the story of, um, I usually tell the story of Cambodia. Go for it. Um, so Cambodia is, you know, if, if you haven't heard of Cambodia, it's, uh, which I'm sure most of you have, but it's a country in Southeast Asia. It's kind of like Thailand's Mexico. So if that gives you any idea of what it is, it's uh, it's not a very rich place. And they had a genocide like 50 years ago. Of this guy who was like kind of communist, but he's also like associated with anarcho-primitivist um, uh, philosophy. And unfortunately, it, it really does make anarcho-primitivists look very bad because he killed about a third of the population in a few years. And when I was like 10 or 11, uh, we went there to this place, the killing fields, they call them the killing fields, and they have literal pyramids of skulls behind glass that you can go and see. Um, and the guide is just a guy who survived the genocide. And then we went to this old school, and that was where people were held, and they told us stories about it, and books about it. Um, and like there was it's a museum, there's like blood on the wall still, because it's like, and it's just behind like a little bit of caution tape. And it's it's like allowed to be like that because it's Cambodia. They don't have a lot of regulations. But, you know, stemming from that, you know, I hear about this, this genocide that happens in the 70s and the 1970s. And, and I was thinking like, well, like we're America. We're so good. Why didn't we do anything about that? I mean, like in my naive young mind. And that really stemmed. From there, I started thinking a lot about how power was organized why things really happened versus why they say they happened uh, in geopolitic in geopolitics, as in when there's a genocide in Cambodia, why doesn't the U.S. do anything to stop it? Whereas, you know, we say World War II happened, you know, to stop the Holocaust. And then I'm thinking and then eventually I find out, of course, oh, World War II, they didn't really care that much about the Holocaust, at least from a tactical, like from a strategic perspective. And so it, it, it came down to me is that it was always rooted in this Cambodia question of why didn't we care about Cambodia? Why was this allowed to happen in Cambodia? Why didn't we do anything about it? And why did we do something about other things? Um, you know, thinking like, why are we in Vietnam? Why did we not go to Cambodia? And that really comes down to how power is organized and how power is organized and, and what reasons people give, what different costless bellies people use, what different reasons for war what different reasons for interactions, what different justifications people use of the bad in their society. Like, for example, any, any, all the bad of the West of, you know, imperialistic wars, all these things. It depends on your definition of what bad is and what good is, and that's culturally informed itself on how you view these actions. Um, so that is why I care about cultural anthropology, and uh, I, I hope that makes sense. I can expand on any of those details. No, I, I think I can I can definitely relate to where you're coming from. I think we get an interest in, in questions when we start, especially at a young age. I, I've noticed that with a lot of guys in this space that would take a, a specific academic niche that they get really interested when they're younger. I mean, I've told this story before, but for, for new listeners, you know, I got really interested in international relations my freshman year of high school when I picked up a book from 
uh, George Friedman called the next 100 years, you know, forecasting the American century. And I thought, you know, and there's that book is not aged well in a lot of ways, or his his perspective on the world, I think, is not as strong as I originally thought it was. But, you know, for someone who was like 14 and 15 years old, reading about how you can use history and geography and military strength and ecology and, and politics to give an accurate or a quasi accurate forecast of what the century is going to look like blew my mind. And that made me want to understand why does the world act the way that it does? And why are we more, you know, why do we focus so much on one part of the world over the other and the nature of empire? And that passion has been with me ever since I I got two degrees, I focused on American history and internet um, and uh, political science focused on international relations. And uh, I was originally going to be study to go to go to law school, but I I opted not to for a variety of reasons. One, because I was already working as a paralegal and sucked i was my soul was just not happy with it like oh this is pretty miserable i don't want to i don't want to pursue it and waste like six figures but here we are um yeah but no i i I definitely can see why that raises questions about well why don't we do things or why is it the moral warm fuzzies that our government or the media tells people you know are, are these warm fuzzies really what they are or is it more of a lie that we have to tell ourselves to keep the sort of political machine going and nine times out of ten you know it, it's usually the latter uh but there there was i was going through some of your work and one of the things that kind of stuck out to me was that you had a, a four-part series on cultural anthropology and religion and you were also diving into the question of wokeism as a religion uh, it's something that gets debated all the time. I think it's more popularly used here in America than it is by our uh, European friends on the right across the pond. But, you know, I've heard individuals like Charles Haywood say it's not a religion because there's no transcendent aspect to it. There's no, you know, there's no sort of sanctification, deification, apotheosis. But uh, you had sort of taken on the the classical definitions of religion. And, and took a different approach. And so I was just curious if you could expand on your thoughts on that here for our listeners. Yeah, so, um, you know, what a religion is, is religion itself is, is a social construct. So when you have a religion, the fact that you're judging if something is a religion or not, and it's state as a religion, that has to come from the definition of the religion. Does that make sense? Sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I can see where you're coming from. And I mean, before we um, I, maybe it's a good place to stop there, too, because when most people hear social construct, you'll hear people say things like mainly from liberals that like, oh, race is a social construct or they'll they'll use that word as a way to get their particular ends. And usually yeah. when I when you hear it from someone on the right, you normally an alarm bell might ring off thinking like, well, what is this guy really on about? But, um, you know what? How? perhaps says the word social construct or that term or the the phenomenon behind it, how has that been changed from its, say, original academic position to how we see it being used in the culture war? Yeah, so this is actually something that I have to do all the time. I, I like, I, I sometimes forget, I forgot this time, that people have associations with these words. Like, I have to defend the term cultural relativism a lot. I have to defend the term social construct a lot. And to me, these are just tools that are, are classical tools of of anthropology that you would find like cultural relativism comes from Clifford Geertz, who did some fantastic work, who has one of the definitions of the anthropology of religion that I want to talk about. He was one of the original ethnographers who, who did some great stuff. But unfortunately, these words have been demonized and their definitions have been changed or co-opted, or at least the associations that people have with those words, which effectively changes, does change their definitions. So when I'm talking about a social construct, I'm talking about within the field of anthropology, the anything that is socially constructed, and obviously I have to expand on that, but when it's socially constructed, that means it is a cultural trait. It's not one that is innate. So the idea that race is a social construct, yes, race is a social construct. There is DNA and there are innate features and phenotypes that people have, but what makes it a social construct is that there is a definition, there is a line drawn somewhere where humans are deciding what it is. So when I think of a social construct, I actually view it from from quite a right wing perspective, because when I say social construct, I'm saying anything that's within the realm of man outside of the realm of God. And that's 
and so to me, it's it's something that's that's very good because I'm saying that when it's a social construct, it is a um, you know it, it's uh, it's not eternal, it's not um, it's not the way, it's not the Tao, it's not it, it's not God. It is if it's socially constructed, that means that a man decided decided it, and then it can be judged on its credibility in any way I, I don't have to you know there isn't it, it's not sacred to me if it's socially constructed from a academic perspective when i'm looking at it hmm. so yeah i i definitely can see why you'd have to like constantly reaffirm or or to, to defend what you're saying because like you had said earlier at the beginning you know cultural anthropology and a lot of our humanities have become so abhorrently left-wing that you know, when people we have sort of this immune response when we hear those words that it's just like, whoa, you know, are you sure you really are guy kind of deal? And so yeah. no, I, I can understand that frustration. <laughs> yeah. And I'm honestly like I, I am, you know, I'm on the E right in the sense that this is the ecosystem that I'm in and the people I talk to and all of my listeners. But I, I've I, I've been jumping between parties. I'm definitely socially conservative, which is what puts me here. But um, yeah, my economic beliefs are sometimes falling into the left wing, um, but with the basis of a right wing cultural background, which is like, you know, some people that I talk to, I mean, they're not that I would identify one, but there, there is the idea of Christian socialism, which is mostly BS, but I think that it could be applied in the right way in a completely different social construct or, or um, social context rather. But yeah, uh, culturally I am, the thing is, it's okay. So cultural relativism is the one that I even have to defend more often. So from a, when I say cultural relativism, what cultural relativist is generally applied today from a left-wing perspective is people will judge a, a society outside the West by its own standards. And they, and that's what culturally relative means. It means judging another culture by its own standards. And the reason for this is to do better participant observation, keyword, um, to do better um, ethnography, which is studying other cultures, and ethnology, which is comparing different cultures. So to compare different cultures, you have to judge them by their own values, their own socially constructed values that are based on a multitude of factors, including their environment. So um, when I'm talking about being culturally relativist, relativist, I'm not talking about with my moral judgments of another culture. I mean, I can judge the Aztecs as being demonic, evil, sacrificing people, whatever. But when I'm judging them, I am as an individual person, I'm putting socially constructed values onto them. When I'm trying to, to understand the Aztecs as a civilization, why they did the things that they did, who they were, as well as their counterparts in the conquistadors, who can both be viewed as being pretty bad people in different contexts. But from a culturally relativist perspective, I want to look at them academically and judge them and see why they performed the way they did, why they did the things that they did. And um, and in that way, you can understand the cultures better. But what tends to happen is the left wing will apply cultural cultural relativity very selectively, selectively, and they will only apply it to cultures that they view as oppressed. And they'll generally view any negative traits as in a lot of cases being influenced entirely by white people, which is ridiculous. And it removes agency from the people being studied. But what I like to do is if you apply it to everybody, including your own culture and including cultures that you would find maybe even abhorrent, then, you know, it's, it's not a problem and it's an incredibly good academic tool. Absolutely. Well, okay. so that, that kind of gives us a good chance to swing back in now, I guess, onto the subject of of wokeness as it is. It's a it's a it, uh, that word itself. I, I take a lot of issue with. I, I think that you know we we more pundits I think like to just debate what that means. When I think maybe just saying leftism or progressivism might be better. But when we say you know wokeism as a religion, you know I, I let let's let's dive into that. I mean, would would you classify that in your own understanding as a religion or? Because when people look at it, they sort of see, you know, well, I can see an ecclesia here in the, the Greek sense, you know, a gathering of people, a group of people that call themselves woke. But, you know, what properties of religion do you see out of it? And what definitions are we, we should we use when applying uh, religion and wokeness together? Okay, so I've got, let me just, I can share these as my screen. Sure, um, go for it. I, I, I don't need you to do anything for that because I have this set up as long as it works properly. Let's see. Um, 
All right. Well, there you go. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that's um, these are three definitions of the anthropology of religion. But what I'd like to make clear is that um, calling something a religion is already using a social construct. And the compartmentalization of uh, these different concepts, I think, is destructive to religion uh, as, as it's understood. And there's one other one one other evidence I'd like to do. I had to grab the book. Yeah, sure. Um, the book, The Tao Te Ching, which I have right here. But it's when you decide, when they decided to define religion in the entomology of the word, the changing definition changed quite a bit over the last like thousand years. But the compartmentalization of religion, of society, of these different definitions, economy is itself doing a sort of disservice to what a religion is because it's it's defining what should be the realm of god with the words of man and it's socially constructed so i think that whenever i from an academic perspective i can judge whether wokeism is a religion or not but that requires me defining what religion is itself and unfortunately the reason this is so important is because it has legal implications in the united states for what is protected and what is not and so beliefs that are very sacred to people um, are viewed as not religious in certain ways, whereas wokeness, whatever you want to call it, I define, if I'm going to talk about a word like that, I, I put my own definition forward and say in that context what I'm going to be referring it to it as. But then wokeness, which in a lot of ways is a religion, gets past the legal definition of the separation of church and state. So they're allowed to indoctrinate children um, because of that. But so you have to define religion in order to have a discussion about it in order to have an academic debate about it in order to perform ethnology in the context of comparing different religions but essentially it, defining it is something that wasn't really common religion prior to the enlightenment prior to the enlightenment was just what people did and, and in a lot of parts of the world it still is just what people do. It's it's an eternal truth that's as real as as other truths, and I. It's hard for me to get this feeling across because you just I I came to that conclusion after seeing a bunch of different examples, reading different ethnographies about different religions. But you know, in a lot of other parts of the world, these areas are not compartmentalized because they're supposed to be with each other. The economy, the the economic aspects, the religious aspects, all of these. But here are three definitions. That was a lot of pretext to this. Um, so Emile Durkheim's definition, this is the one that I use generally. It's probably the best one. Religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. That is to say, things set apart and forbidden. Beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community called a church, all those who adhere to them. Clifford Geertz's definition. Religion is a system of symbols which acts to establish powerful, pervasive, and long-standing moods and motivations in men by formulating conceptions of a general order of existence and clothing those conceptions with such an aura, aura of factuality that the moods and motivations seem uniquely realistic. In Melford Spiro's definition, religion is an institution consisting of culturally patterned interaction with culturally postulated superhuman beings. So I will pause there for a moment um for you to say whatever you'd like because i was talking for too long <laughs> yeah no no you're, you're perfectly fine I, I think that it's always good to come back to uh definitions on those issues because we we find ourselves in such a way that we 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 look at things and we just react with our gut and sometimes we we should also look back to what did ethnographers what did the sort of old anthropologists say um, on these issues. When I, I look at those three definitions and I, I kind of see the sort of, um, I, you know, when I, people talk about wokeness, I, I've defined it as just like systematizing leftism. You know, it's a way to homogenize everything. They, you know, I mean, those definitions are really good to use because they do hold certain things sacred. They, they do hold this sort of, uh, I mean, they, they acknowledge things that like, oh, you can't be a complete egalitarian. There are innate differences between people, but we can't say the reasons why uh, to acknowledge that it might be forbidden truth or heresy. So you see people will go along the lines and they'll say things like, oh, well, structural racism. 
is bad and we have to abolish that and it's our transcendent goal for for equality or some kind of you know race communism to happen and there's a, a position to have minorities held as sacred they can do no wrong type deal so yeah i i see religious elements drip through it and especially with both uh geertz's and spyro's definition there are there's an institutions of academics and non-governmental organizations for social progress that really do want these things to be near children's schools and to be in television 24 seven and to propagate these ideas to me, you know, it's a sort of a, a state sanctioned state sponsored sort of like conversion that we're going to bring about. Like we we've conquered Carthage, you know, you're going to obey and worship the Roman gods now type deal. Um, and this is sort of the consequences of, of cultural battles that I think have been lost decades prior to either of us were born. Right. Yeah, yeah, seriously. I mean, the the the, the laws that are put into place and, and the things that are being taught are the result of of who is in of who of what the people believe that are in the positions of authority that push those things out. And, you know, a lot of these things are are they're lagging um, like decades, even generations in how they affect the culture, because people have to be born indoctrinated and then move into positions of authority based on the own traits that the traits that they've developed and the traits that those socially constructed places filled with their own individuals who decide who gets to come in, who gets to do what, um, are the gatekeepers to that. But yes, it's, it's layers and layers and layers. I start to sound like a hippie when I talk about it too much. <laughs> well, I feel like anytime we talk about, uh, the social sciences, it's just an inevitability of what's going to happen. And, I, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, those are sort of the, that's the linguistic tool set that you have, but that doesn't mean uh, we have to come to the conclusions of of the left in, in any way, shape or form, which I certainly don't. And this, maybe that's my sunk cost fallacy trying to like cope as I, I think about all of the like post-structuralists I read in college, like um, Eileen Baido and, and others where I'm just like, well, I got to find a way to justify the fact I've read all this and took notes, but you know, it's neither, neither here nor there. Uh, but I mean, when it comes to sort of religiosity, the we, we've seen in in the West over the course of say the Industrial Revolution, there has been a push towards secularization. There has been a push towards a more materialistic understanding of how the world operates. There has been, of course, uh, even prior to the Industrial Revolution, we saw this during Revolutionary France as well that there had been a significant decline in French birth rates as well. That this all sort of kind of comes together. You have a rather antenatal social religiosity that often gets called woke or progressive or leftist. And on top of that, you have, you know, sort of all outstanding economic pressures that do so. But then there's also the, the same thing that I think is one of the things I wanted to ask you, especially on, on the nature of history and anthropology, uh, is, is that we, we can talk about the economic issues all that we want, but I always go back to looking through the history of the Black Plague. I always find that history really interesting. I lived overseas as a kid. I was an army brat. And to go visit these old European towns that had been around since even prior to the bubonic plague. And you will go through and you'll talk and they'll have museums about it. And they'll say, like, it didn't matter that, you know, a third of Europe had died. People still got married. People still sued each other in courts of law. They still got married. They still had kids and they still you know, they still went to church on Sundays, despite the fact that people were dying left and right. And, you know, to me, that sort of says a lot about willpower or, or the will to, to survive and go on. I, um, our, my friend Ernst van Zyl of Con Conscious Caracol over at Afriform had said, you know, even in the camps during the Second Boer War, you know, people were having uh, children inside the camps that the English ran uh, over prisoners of war and such. And so, you know, the, I guess the question becomes like, where's the line on maybe an anthropological level where can we define our willpower or our will to live, our will to survive? Because, you know, I, I do agree by all means that there are serious material problems. Like, I mean, yeah, immigration's an issue. Our cost of living is way too high. Inflation is an issue. Why are there so many people buying homes and things like that? Uh, that are not going to go to actual homeowners. They're going to go to renters or property developers like BlackRock and such. Uh, but still, you know, people seem to have given up uh, outside of maybe the religious or maybe just the more like <laughs> racist materialists out there. Uh, you know, where how do we look or, or can we measure sort of a society's will to live or will to go on? Well, that's a fantastic question. 
Um, so any measure, again, any measure that you would create is of course going to be socially constructed. So it's going to, to be by whatever metric your culture has. So you can create metrics by how you judge that. Um, but this is something that's used in social science very often. People will decide a metric for judging society, something like GDP or GDP per capita. And then what you find is while that metric worked for a long time and people will still use that metric to show how great the country is, is doing, when you then look at other metrics, which maybe other people find important, then you see a different story. You, you see that people, consumer debt is at an all-time high, which is true, and that more people are behind on their mortgages since like 2008, which is also true. You see that um, violent deaths are are at an all time high uh, for for black males specifically, but for um, for black males between eighteen and forty five, that is true, higher than ever, higher than ever. For the average American population, including black people and everyone else, it's near the highest levels ever, which is the seventies and eighties. Um, and there are all these other other metrics which show you that there are issues in society. But it, it, there's a few things I I, I want to say between that like yes there is a massive resiliency to the to the human spirit but that generally has to come with the right mindset and the right uh situation like you'll see the resilience of a population that's been you know uh, that's been attacked with a natural disaster or the blitz or you know i don't want to get political or, or current but regardless of how you feel about it, you see a massive showing of people in uh, Palestine and in Israel after violence is, is done to their people, regardless of how you feel about either side. That's what you see. And I'm sure you've heard the stories about the Blitz. Now, those are situations, and even 9-11, even you know, the response to that, the way that people feel about it. Uh, there is definitely something to the resilience of the human spirit within that and but that has to come with purpose and, and ideology and i think that that is what our culture is severely lacking in and uh while there is a lot of like there is a true reality um i i think that it is more true that perception is reality in the sense that everything that you view is uh and this is a buddhist idea but it's created once in reality and then once in your mind and so any, any thought that you or any other human has ever had is through the filter of your biology and your human culture. And so ideology can really shift the way that people think about things. And they can think that we're doing really well, even though by our own standards, I don't, mental health issues are at an all time high, mental health diagnoses, especially in younger people are at an all time high. And I would say that that, um, that shows that we're not doing a good job. And when you look at material factors, a lot of them, like people are fed, but maybe that's the problem number one but also if that's not it then it has to be the mindset that people have and the mindset that people have in a lot of cases i think especially liberal people um and this is shown in statistics of who is diagnosed uh, and this could be an issue of who is actually going to see the um who is actually going to get diagnosed but really it does seem to me that liberal people are less happy because they don't submit to these things. They submit to ideologies that are worship of the self, that are um, worship of the individual, saying that certain longstanding cultural traditions, uh, which, you know, you can use your imagination, I won't, I won't go into specifics, but that those things don't matter at all. And it leads to a life uh, without purpose, and that is disconnected from human biology. Um, and the last thing, and I'm sorry, this is kind of how I talk. I'm sure you realize when you listen to Stone Age Herbalist that, you know, we both did this, just spewed word vomit at, at each other that was relatively related. Um, relativity. Relativity is really important to to humans. It's uh, material, like, it, it doesn't matter that, like, what somebody has now. It matters what somebody has in relation to what they had in the past. And that's why in China, even though, People are much worse off than people in the United States. People are generally better off than their parents, which is much more important. Whereas in the United States, people of the millennial generation and from Gen Z are worse off than their parents in a lot of important ways. Home ownership, jobs, um, it's so much more expensive to do all these different things. And we're worse off than our parents. And that relativity is more important because we have expectations that were crafted throughout our lifetimes. 
And then when the real world doesn't meet those expectations, we're having cognitive dissonance. And that's the kind of thing that becomes a major problem. Um, yeah, I hope I said, I hope I answered your, your questions. Well, no, I think it's an important thing to consider because we look at how things are. I mean, I, I think it's, I think everyone in this audience is definitely going to agree that like anyone who's following a, a leftist framework, especially if you're a, a white guy, that you're probably a terminally unhappy person. Uh, I asked this question sort of as a, as a quasi gotcha, quasi rhetorical question where it's just like, if you're a straight white male progressive, what's your role model? Um, in terms of like, what does a, what does a progressive straight white male role model look like to you? And if you look in the media, it's usually guys that, you know, they give up on things. They recognize it's not their turn anymore. They have to give things up. They have to sacrifice. It's the suicidal ideation, uh, of this sort of like warped messianic complex that like, well, if I just bow down and I give up and let the other people do it, cause it's their term, I'll feel happy for them. It's that sort of uh, telepathic sympathy sort of deal. I, I tell people all the time, I, I said, really the book for a lot of people on the right should be reading again is Bleak House because we all kind of live in Miss, Mrs. Jellybee's long, you know, long house where she's got this telescopic sympathy. She cares about some aboriginal tribe halfway around the world. And she doesn't care that her children are sick or hungry and not anything like that. And people suffer for it. We haven't really escaped uh, the sort of Mrs. Jellybee kind of liberalism of today. But the, the reason why I think it's so important to sort of consider the, the will and the metaphysical desire and, and the human spirit is, is because, you know, we, we've witnessed, I think, very clearly the, this, what gets often called the Great Awakening or just the the mask coming off on progressivism. And you notice, and a lot of people like to say it's 2012, although we can go back much earlier in sort of the institutional capture of the academy. But you notice in 2012, Obama gets reelected. You know, the, the talk of the emerging Democratic majority happens. There's this desire to all of a sudden change, you know, and the GOP is gone for a generation. Like, it's our turn to re, you know, structure the world as we see it. And I mean, Obama made that promise. He was going to radically transform the country. And so you, we really begin to see the, you know, more feminist critics of society, video games, et cetera, emerge. So we see much more racial attention being focused in America with respect to its demographics. And there's been a really nonstop demoralization campaign for, you know, a lot of Americans, primarily white Americans in the United States. And so, you know, now we've got uh, this war going on um, in uh, halfway around the world on top of the fact that we're funding another war in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, everyone's sort of nervous about what it is and everyone's just kind of checked out. Uh, I'm sure you saw that article from Bloomberg saying like the S&P 100 since 2021, they only hired, you know, 6% of white males, the other 94% went to minorities and other um, minority classifications. And so I, I guess the question might be from an anthropological perspective, have has there been a time like this in the past where, you know, a, a group of people or a particular uh, ethnic group or class of people has been uh, subject to such a, you know, state sanctioned demoralization campaign uh, in society for whatever uh egalitarian religious reason uh you know did they do we have examples of sort of survival do we have examples of what that might have looked like in the past or is this a relatively novel phenomenon mm. well there's a lot of comparisons that that i could draw um but all of them are going to be it's so much stuff that goes on today is just unique to the modern world because of our technological level and, and the amount of global influence that that gives but there are a number of different, like, you know, rhyming type things that are that are not exact comparisons, um, you know, because in, in a lot of different multi-ethnic empires, and when I'm usually traditionally multi-ethnic empires, besides in areas of trade, cosmopolitan cities, people would generally, even if they were mixed within a local region or territory, they would generally live in villages or towns of their own sort of identity, depending on on what it is. There's definitely plenty of times when a when a government has sold out their own ethnic group to a their own ethnic group and maybe their own kingdom for a small minority to benefit to a larger sort of uh, Persian Empire, Ottoman Empire, that type of thing. There's a lot of situations like that uh, within like different city states of Aleppo, 
um, of the Ottoman Empire. There's situations where, yeah, th that would be the best one that I could say. It's it, it, it you see it it's such a ridiculous thing, right? Because you think that if you identify as a group, you identify with that group, that you would always protect them if you can. I, I think that the issue is that the people who are making these decisions, this idea of like, you know, white Americans, of course, the idea of a white American is a is also a post-World War II idea. And like the and there are other examples of it and we, and we can if you want to push back we can we can discuss it but discuss uh, yeah it. I, was like, I was like i might just because the the word white has been used in, in a in a specific and even our earliest immigration laws mm -hmm. uh you know 1790 you know a, a free white male of upstanding character that's not an indentured servitude or, or indentured servant or a slave um i mean i think maybe in the post-war sense in a more maybe anthropologically or ethnically uh adversarial way maybe white has been uh, introduced in that kind of concept but I, I think that even prior to the end of world war ii you know the idea of america as sort of a, a group of white people has been around i mean i recall rather famously uh former president um you know theodore roosevelt had said that you know democracy is actually really good for white people uh it's a way it's the best way that they can sort of compete on a world stage and, and things such as that matter but um, I am curious to to hear what you mean by that. I don't mean to like yeah. just jump down your throat, but it, no, you know, no, no, I, no. I hear that and my eyebrow kind of got cocked instantly. So I, I guess it would be more accurate to say that the modern conception of whiteness in any practical sense is a post World War II idea. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, the concept of white did exist, but I, I think that often it is understated the amount of discrimination that. Irish and Italian and these non-traditionally um, white groups faced at these times and how they weren't necessarily considered as part of it. And there's also, th there's other distinctions as well. I mean, there's the idea of, uh, there's certain examples of the founding white stock in the new world, um, like the, the aristocratic ones identifying themselves as Norman. Um, there were attempts to create a uh, white underclass between free whites um, based on Anglo-Saxon peasantry in North Carolina. There were real attempts to do that. So it's, yes, the concept of what white is might have existed, but even today, like white is viewed as the most prominent um, ethnic characteristic, whereas, or, or any sort of identifying characteristics, whereas in the past, different types of whites would be considered Yes, maybe they're white, but the more important characteristic is the combination of their ethnicity and their religion. And I mean, the when, when you're talking about nativist um, nativist ideology, if you think about the 1920s, this nativist ideology was was anti-Jewish. It was uh, anti-Catholic. Um, I mean, they 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 lynched Catholics, burned down Catholic churches, Catholic schools. Um, they even like the Fighting Irish um, got their name from fighting the KKK. Like it's not, this was not a, it's, it's social science in, um, has really, really pushed down the idea that the Irish and, and the Italians and many other groups, but those specifically, um, faced any sort of real discrimination, but, th but that's a lie. And it's a lie meant to, um, it's meant to discredit the, uh, it's meant to push all white people together into one group that is, uh, an out group from the, the modern um, modern conception, but it's also to make it clear that the only legitimate discrimination is the discrimination against black people in America, I think. So it's, um, like even my, I mean, my dad, my parents are Catholic. My, my dad is, uh, Irish, half Irish Catholic, half Hungarian Catholic. My mom is full Irish Catholic. And my, my dad grew up in a Catholic neighborhood in the 1950s. So it, it's like, it's, it was even going on then, but world war II does um make whiteness as in we think of it today much more of a uh, unified idea and this is when the uh white like europe uh spanish italians uh irish eastern europeans they were under world war ii they were unified essentially uh and then through assimilation with public schools but up until World War II, you know, it, it's a changing definition over time and it will continue to change. And, and likely, you know, a lot of Hispanics are going to be starting 
to be viewed as whites, especially like white Hispanics, like Cubans or Argentinians. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we definitely saw that in the aftermath of the 2020 election. I, the, the Washington Post had their little famous headline, you know, multiracial whiteness. Uh, and even, you know, whether you like him or hate him, uh, Zero HP Lovecraft, I think, has made a, a very good observation that there is this uh, Latin, you know, oriented, Hispanic oriented struggle for white identity. There is a, a large portion of Hispanics that do opt to identify as white. And we, we notice, and again, this kind of, this goes back to a, a poll and report on religion in the Pew Research Center, that by this third generation of Hispanics, they usually become less Catholic, more charismatic, evangelical, uh, and, you know, their kids probably aren't going to know Spanish. So, you know, that, that looks like that tends to be the case. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely a battle for what white is going to constitute in, in America. I, I do agree with that. And I mean... The, the the question over, say, ethnogenesis is always being still debated to this day. I think that there are throughout the course of history, there's been multiple American ethnogenesis. I mean, in the very earliest New England founders, I definitely think that you can trace the first one in America to uh, King Philip's War. You know, if you, you read the stories out of that and you definitely saw people emerge out of that literal race war for extermination. I've done archaeology. on Yeah. That, it's a or... it's a bloody bloody uh conflict and yeah. uh the the first hand accounts which have been published and you can read them and, and i, I have, have it's they're yeah. yeah so i mean like from there you get sort of this um more identity emerging out of it the same after the french and uh indian war the seven years war and so i i'm not surprised that that term is going to evolve i it's always important to understand its evolution but yeah i think that Hispanics in America will definitely be fighting over what it means to be white. And I'm sure that there will, you know, for even in 20 years from now, whatever social media exists, there will be someone calling them brown, regardless of how long they've identified as white uh, in the United States. But yeah, uh, I've seen yeah. it happen to Pete Canones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and Pete's great. And I met Pete in person. He's a fantastic oh, guy. Great. I mean, he's calls, you know, he's from Iberia, you know, his, his family lineage is from Spain and, and from mm -hmm. nor and Northern Europe, like a dude's white in my book, but you know, yeah, uh, it, he's white. I, it's, 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 I guess it's like a dealer's choice when it comes to individual people. And maybe that's the reason why those issues will still be debated. But I, I mean, that's a, that's a good point to, to bring into as well, because, you know, we, we've, a lot of people like to forecast what the future of American politics likes to look like. And I think a lot of people on our side of things, of course, I think are righteously justified. It's sort of checking out on the issues of, you know, democracy having a lot of change on the national level. Um, there's, of course, the ongoing competency crisis, which is a really nice way to just say that there are racial issues that we can't talk about in polite society. So we're going to frame it as competency. Uh, yeah. there's, we, we, we're just playing this long, like linguistic, you know, circumlocution over how can we say the thing that we want to say without doing it. And that really does show you how much power the sort of progressive pedagogy has in sort of American academia and polite society. But, you know, uh, there's a guy that you've re reacted to. I've reacted to, I kind of don't like, I, I like some of his takes most of the time. I think he's just kind of got this centrist liberal worldview, um, you know, the Walt, what if alt history guy, uh, you know, he's got an interesting view on where America's going in a few years, but um, I don't want to make this a sort of like diss on that guy kind of stream, yeah. but you know, where do you see sort of uh, America going as, you know, even with the present conflicts included, like where, how do you see from an anthropological perspective, where do you see America going? Um, so there's, um, there's two books on this mm -hmm. that uh, that you will probably like because that, that you might have heard of, but they they involve essentially cycles. And that is uh, an economic history, I should say, is one of my favorite forms of history. Economic history, I, I really enjoy. So there's Ray Dalio's Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order. And that is kind of an economic book. He's a hedge fund investor. Um, but it has a lot of economic history in it. And then there is cycles of crisis order and reform. And I forget who wrote that one, but they're, they're not, they're not perfect, but that in addition to a lot of other books, um, tell me that 
Um, so number one, I should say that it's very hard to predict oh, yeah. the future, especially from now, because there's so much stuff that is that is absolutely unprecedented. But I would say that there's a number of possibilities, and the most um, it, the the worst of them is that the United States will not be able to survive a shift away from in, in its current form, away from having the world reserve currency status and that removal from the entire uh, removal of the the money and flows into the United States. We have no manufacturing. We don't make any real stuff here. So it's possible that with our unprecedented technology, we shift away, we lose reserve currency status entirely, and we're screwed. Uh, another case is that China collapses, and we're probably screwed from that. But maybe we survive, and we still have at the top of a unipolar, unipolar world. Mm. The, the most likely scenario that I see is um, right now, I, I think that there is going to be a shift and we've already seen the beginnings of a shift towards right-wing politics as a response to what's been happening here. Um, I hope that there can be some sort of new likely coming from a populist candidate of some kind to change the economic situation in the country, because I don't think that it is sustainable in any real way. Um, I think that we're, we're on the edge of an economic crisis, but I, I've thought that for a long time and I've been wrong. So maybe I'm finally correct this time, but I've been wrong a lot. So I don't know. Um, but I see a right wing shift, including uh, a closing of immigration, a non arbitrary shift in the way that governance is handled. Um, and that's going to be forced through a situation where there's some sort of black swan event, which makes everything more serious, along with the shifting the ways that ideology has shifted the last few years and how people experience it and how they feel about it is what that new thing looks like. But I think that it is possible for, you know, I think we get a few bad years and then we'll be okay on the other side, moving into maybe a multipolar world. But, uh, I don't think I'm being very coherent right now. <laughs> well, I think See, it's hard. It's always hard to predict the future. I mean, I try, uh, not, forecasting is always difficult and when you have a record of forecasting you know like that, that's a great way to uh have people judge your record and such i i for instance um it, you know i i've gotten things wrong you know i that's why i usually hedge my bets like i hedged my bet with the invasion of ukraine i said well if they do it you know it'll turn into this like lengthy bloody syria like conflict if not you know who knows but uh yeah no i i think that there's going to be there's there's a long there's a few things that I I wonder if you've read his book and I know that Peter Zihan kind of gets he's sort of a meme or he's sort of like a glowing asset or whatever. It. Have you read the the end of the world is just beginning? Yeah, I've read it. Okay, well, what did you think of that? Because I I read it and it was like witnessing a urban cosmopolitan who just loves his fusion foods and loves to travel everywhere get really upset that um this like age of decadence is about to end, but it's okay kids because America can just, you know, bring in more people and we'll be all right. Um, and, but I mean, he's pointing out rather important things such as, you know, there are demographics crises that are not, ha that are happening, not just in the West, but also in China. Although he's sort of been a, a China will collapse guy for a long time now, but a lot of people have. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I still think that there is the issue of demographics is still, I think, a very real issue. It is. I don't yeah. um, that that you can't that's destiny. You can't escape that. But uh, what, what did you think of his takes um, on that book? Because I, I like I said, I, I read it. Some of it I, I, I agreed with. But in the other ways, I'm like, he's so smugly thinking that we can survive this. Um, you know, he's like looking at the edge of the precipice and is like, yeah, this is fine. We'll we'll be OK. Not like it's the end of the world or anything. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's so it, it the, the problem like I like, you know, the book Guns, Germs and Steel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, look, everybody criticizes that book from all different directions, but I think it's great. I got I, I read a bunch of different ones and they all have their problems. I think when a book becomes extraordinarily popular and especially when that person works for a think tank that it's easy to criticize them. But I don't know if his if his takes are even like, they definitely are what you describe. I, I mean, that's the way that I feel about them. But I think that at the same time, those takes are, 
I, I don't know if they're more invalid than any of the other books I've written on it or the ones that I or read on it or the ones that I just described. I, I think that they're just they're just that's that perspective. And it does seem ridiculous. But I think the fact that we are so bad at foreshadowing because this stuff is so complex, there's so many different factors at play at any given time that what will probably end up happening is not really what we think is going to happen. And there's some other factor somewhere that'll change it. And, you know, there were a lot of people that thought 2008 was like the end, like that was going to be it. And like people in really, really high up positions and that worked out. So like it, it might not work out. I'm not confident in it working, but there's a lot of different people whose personal livelihoods depend on making the system continue. And if those people are threatened personally, which they will be in some sort of global shutdown, then I think that we'll start to see solutions that have to happen in the same way that there were a lot of significant reforms to our economic and labor situation in response to the threat of communist overthrow. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's a more technical thing in the sense that there is technical problems that need to be solved, but they're both just problems and humans are problem solving machines. Yeah, no, I, I can see where you're coming from, because I, I think of books like What to Do When the Russians Come, you know, these old sort of cold warrior books that are like, well, you know, in case these things are to happen, here's how we can survive or here's how we can manage and here's what to do about it. And at the same time, you know, like, well, the Russians did kind of come not in the sense that, like, you know, it was Red Dawn, but rather like they're that that disgusting form of like racial Bolshevism is definitely still around in America. Um, right. And we have to deal with it, for instance. I, I do think that, you know, I don't think it's the end of the human species, it, you know, whatever this collapse may be. I mean, lest, you know, lest some sort of black swan event happens and say, you know, the nukes go off everywhere, then that's a different story. But I mean, for now, how I view things is, is that the internet aids in this and, I, and i'm writing this in the backdrop of this of this article i'm writing i think about marshall McLuhan and i think about the orientalizing of the west as he described in the gutenberg galaxy we're far more tribal we're far more looking towards the inward self we're we're much more likely to get agitated over metaphysical and more tribal issues and i think that this was McLuhan looking at the fact that we're going to become way more aware uh, or at least some people will be, because I think it's very easy to look at today's society and be like, well, there are a lot of people that are just, they they do they do their day to day. They don't have a voice in their head. There's no internal monologue. There's no shape rotating going on. And that we have this huge issue of that there people are now being forced to confront their identity. There's that death of childhood innocence. I think that's the reason why there are so many younger, you know, older and younger millennials and now Gen, Gen Z that are on this like permanent like failure to launch infantilization. I mean, I, I I'm sure you know this. Um, I I know a lot of people about I, Disney adults. Oh That's yeah, good. that too, <laughs> right? Like I or kid adults or whatever man children. Yeah. But like I know a lot of people that went and applied for master's degrees just so they didn't have to face the the real world and not get a job and just stay in school. Uh, and I know a lot of people got their PhDs that way. I I didn't. I I got a job after uh, after college. I mean, I worked through college as well. And it's just, uh, and so, you know, I, I think that when it comes to say forecasting, I think it's difficult, but I think that you have a people, we, we we're disintermediated. Like we don't trust, you know, we don't trust Rachel Maddow. We don't trust uh tablet or, you know, commentary magazine or whatever, but people have their own sort of tribes of fandoms. I mean, it's always funny to see like political Twitter accidentally say a word that triggers all these K-pop fans on Twitter and they just go rabid at each other, like a very weird tribal fight uh, between two foreign groups going at one another. And I think you're going to see more of that in, in America, especially as the economic situation gets worse, because, you know, they, they say that we have a, an employment shortage, but you're not hiring competent people. You're not hiring white people. You're not, we're not focusing on our borders. We're not focusing on the fact that, the internal situation at home is ridiculous. I mean, car dealerships are running commercials begging to buy your used car rather than to sell you a used car. And that, you know, supply chain crises have not been, you know, fixed and COVID only made them worse. And whatever war goes on across the sea is going to make them worse. And so I, I see people 
becoming much more fractured, as Charles Haywood would say, far more tribal, far more fractured, and that the only place where it's really going to matter is on a local stage because you have power there. But I think a lot of people nowadays kind of recognize that like on Washington, unless you change the administrative state, we're, my representative's not going to fix my problems. That Those are for sure things that I think are kind of obvious on the walls, especially as people look to the economy and are, are all, everyone's kind of holding their breath, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. And then seeing what's going to happen when it does, because no one really knows how it's going to play out. Yeah. But yeah, there no, are... no one, no one does. I could be wrong, but I, I really do think that there is a, that, that there is a coming crash and that there's going to be a lot of people scrambling in the same way that, 2000 you know I, I think of 2008 and i think in 2009 i was a teenager at the time i wasn't someone Me who too. was you know i wasn't uh like I, i'm only 27 i'm not i'm not a i'm not that old in the slightest but i i think about the fact that there was this sort of po the, you know we had a, a media and a cultural apparatus that allowed that sort of angsty energy that came with economic disruptions to sort of manage whether that be through gaming whether that be through television whether that be through um, you know, just the, the cultural trends of the time. And nowadays, everything is so progressive. I don't think you have that outlet. And people are going to get more angry and people are going to be far more political than they ever were. And it's definitely the case now. We saw that from Gamergate onwards. Everyone is far more political and focused on those things because people are kind of finally realizing the essentials to how things really work, which is you need networks, you need a people, you need an identity, and some people have chosen the most saccharine identities. You know, Disney adults are a really good example. Um, there was an anthropologist, a, a Jewish anthropologist, and she was saying that, like, uh, you know, Disney has, like, become the place for transcendentalism for a lot of, like, irreligious, like, white millennials. And so they, they, they yeah. make it a ritual. They make it a religion. And that's just a, a depressing thing to think about that there's so much more to life than just Disneyland. But for some yeah. people, that's that's their cope. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that is, is that consumer identitarianism will be uh, on the rise. And then there will be actual political people that recognize that there are things that are more important than consumer identities and fandoms that will be more ethnically oriented, I think. But I've, I've been rambling on too long. What, what are your thoughts? No, I, I, I think that that's fantastic. And I love the idea of going to Disneyland or Disney World as a as a ritual because it, it really is. And um, the definition of, of ritual is and it, it, a ritual does not have to be in a religious context either. It can be broadly cultural. But, you know, there, there sort of is a pilgrimage to Disneyland and Disney World. And, you know, I've been there as an adult and, um, you know, I try to get into it. I don't feel the same way about it as other people do. It's cool to see the, the stuff, but like you go there your first time and they they make it a thing with your first time. They put like pins on you. It's like, oh, it's your first time. And then they try to make it extra special or whatever. Um, and you you. They have like. They have like a lot of products that people use that they wear that make it more of a part of their identity that they use they they try to tie them um as much to uh to family as possible like getting items that are like thing one and thing two you know so it's mm -hmm. like an identity with that you have shared with other people is that associates it with your family and just like disney broadly people have their family movies people have family memories of them so those associations with something like that really help to, I think, create a situation where somebody who is living a life without this sort of transcendentalism or any sort of um, any sort of like outside of the general world. But when you're when you're in a place where the rules are different, um, have you heard of the concept of a liminal space? Yes, I just I, I wrote a whole article on that not too long ago. I I, uh, I saw it, that it's a it's a piece of media that I like, um, although I don't entirely understand it. Uh, I like the whole liminal analog horror stuff. It's a personal pet thing of mine that I find absolutely fascinating. That there's this whole sort of generational subculture uh, that is interested in older media that they kind of grew up with as kids but don't really remember. So there's this nostalgic eeriness around it. My my personal thesis is that. 
it's because I think a lot of people are so overstimulated and in a very Ted Kaczynski way, over socialized, like they're so bombarded by things that they kind of just want to act in what's good. And if I'm ever alone thinking with just my brain or myself and I don't have a phone or I'm not stimulated from outside sources, that that can be terrifying. Um, that's mm -hmm. my personal thesis as to why that stuff is so exciting and interesting. And then some people go out, go all out and create fascinating pieces of of internet fiction and uh, like the Mandela catalog or whatever, which is like this weird religious subtext behind the whole story, which is the motivating plot line through it. Like, oh, actually the world has been run by evil and the devil forever and religion is fake and that's terrifying. Like everything's been subverted, you know, like that, that stuff interests me. And I think it's a lot to do with, um, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Frederica Matthews Green not too long ago. She's a, an, an Orthodox Christian writer. Uh, she's married to a priest. And she had said, you know, she says, I, I've given talks all over the world and all over the country. And the world and the word that makes people uncomfortable the most is loneliness. And I think that that is definitely true. And I think that's why the whole liminal spaces thing is definitely on there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and liminal space is it's such a weird concept. It's a very academic term in anthropology. So it's not surprising that, it, that it's a thing. And um that it's a it's a tough thing but there there's a concept that's related to it um which has less of the eeriness of it mm -hmm. um and this concept isn't perfect for describing disney world but but there is this concept of non-place and non-place is related to liminal place in the sense that when you enter it um you are it, it's not that related. I'm sorry. I did this episode a little while ago. No, um, you're, you're, but, you're, but you're good. This. You, 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 it's you for any longtime fans of my stuff will know that that's a subject that is like a pet interest of mine. So you, you, you said the words and you, you just hit me like a uh, MK Ultra code word activated uh, for things that I enjoy. <laughs> yeah, you should listen to that episode um, that I did on, I think, architecture. But um there are these liminal spaces have a lot of significance for rites of passage and they have significance for rites of passage because when you're in a liminal state, which is different, different from a liminal place, but when you're in a liminal state, it's a, it's in a state outside of your, your normal state. So it's a state outside of, um, like a good example of that would be uh boot camp. So you're in this stage of, of an in-between you're in a transition where you and all the people around you are judged by similar rules um, without getting too far into it. The, the, the point is that when you go to someplace like Disney World or Dis Disneyland, the rules are different. There are the rules are different than whatever outside, you know, your your prior identity is subdued. It's not as important. Your identity afterwards, after you leave, you retain your identity. But when you enter through these literal gates you you walk through and psychologically this is a thing that humans really care about when you walk through the entrance to Disney World or Disneyland you're greeted by people you are scanned and you go in you have your ticket then you're in there and essentially you're treated the same as everyone else besides you know a few different extra things and that type of state especially when the rules are different in a way that makes people be allowed to escape um, and there is a community of people there in a lot of sense where there's like a sense of community, how everyone's enjoying the same thing. There's interaction with people that is outside the normal interactions. Your, your people are cosplaying as characters and you're, and they talk to you as those characters. So it's not surprising to me that, that it appeals to people in that way because it allows them to really escape outside of their, their every day. And this relates to one thing that I've been doing recently. I've been doing a documentary on Jimmy Buffett. I'm going to Gulf Shores in a few days to uh, record at Meeting of the Minds for that. And with Jimmy Buffett fans and with, with Parrot Heads in specific, which are people that are actually part of these Jimmy Buffett fan clubs, they have, they're wonderful people, to be honest. And when they meet at Jimmy Buffett concerts or they go to, and I will do that, but my mic will still work. Um, they go to Jimmy Buffett concerts or they have their meetings. They're in a place where their main identity, what really matters to them, um, is them as being a parrot head. It doesn't matter what they were before that. It's they're in this state where they can put apart their normal world and they can exist for a time in this other world where 
their normal stuff doesn't matter. Um, and I think that that's inherently appealing to people. But I don't think it's healthy that for a lot of people, especially a lot of young people, that is tied in with a soulless multinational corporation and not with more localized communities with other people. Yeah, no, it reminds me very much of what John Perry Barlow wrote about deadheads, that the the internet now can be a place for deadheads to meet and sort of have a, a form of escapism because not every deadhead can go and follow the band on tour 24-7. They don't have the money or the means to do so. And so uh, the online space, you know, allows people to live an alternate life. I've talked about this at length uh, on the subject of digital deracination. I gave a whole talk on it in the Sildings Conference in 2022. And I, I do agree that that's going to play a, a, a large part because I think when you think about political organization or you think about how societies get formatted uh, or they or, or not formatted, but how they're formed, uh, that there are basic, you know, tenants to an identity and how they, they do so. And I think that fandom is a big way in which people, you know, turn off real world, go to work, you know, screw work, whatever, and then they'll go and their, you know, their real life is online in the same way that for a lot of people, Twitter is is more of real life than say their their actual life or, or, or so on. And to me, that's a really yeah important thing to consider because you know when i was younger you know you'd play games like fallout 3 or or whatever like all these sort of post-apocalypse things like new vegas is a good example like there's a whole little sub faction that is dedicated to like elvis presley impersonators the kings and it, it's kind of funny to think about like there's no way on earth in in a post-apocalypse like there would be a society like formatted around like the kings or whatever uh, you know, about Elvis Presley. And then you think about, well, uh, you know, you look you look outside and there's whole people that are just have their entire lives dedicated to, you know, specific kinds of pornography or political activism or uh, bands and, and so on and so forth. Like maybe it's not too far of a stretch from reality. And I think that we're going to see more of that because so many people in the United States um, in general, I think this is the issue that, has made religion so much more of a focus now. I mean, new atheism has kind of putered out and it gave birth to sort of this progressive, you know, racialist monster that we have right now uh, that gets defined as wokeism. But, you know, now you've seen a returned emphasis on religiosity, not just Christianity, but also um, a renewed interest in uh, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, you know, neo-pagan or old European style pre-Christian mythologies and societies. Uh, because people are still looking for things that are not artificial, things that have a lineage that are, are grounded in history and reality. And that's why I think to tie it back to, you know, the work that you do, we do see that a lot of cultural anthropology, ethnography, anthropolo anthropology and history has been so dominated by the left, especially really since this more Frank Boas, Tabla Rousa understanding of society has become so dominant that it allows people to rewrite the actual truth right before our eyes. And people are looking for things that have their own history that are outside of that dogma of progressivism. Um, is that a fair, you know, uh, take on your, on your part or are you seeing something different? No, I, I, I agree. I think, um, I think Franz Boas is, uh, his original idea was actually, he gets a bad rap because again, he's the guy who came up with cultural relativism, but, uh, and I, I might have misquoted that before. Um, I haven't mentioned Boaz yet, but the the stuff that does come later is is the stuff that comes out of that is really the bad stuff. It's uh, Franz Boaz, I think himself. Maybe you don't you know something I don't, but I think that was like early 1900s, prior to World War II, like prior to the end of World War One, which is a totally non arbitrary end. Um, but of course, these ideas expand over time. However, largely, yes, I do entirely agree with you that the left has taken these things over. And um, but I, I don't see I, I, I see the way that information I, I you know, the universities maybe are beyond saving. We'll, we'll see. But um, I, I think that and this is a Kaczynski approach in a lot of ways, but that culture follows technology and universities are a legacy system that has is largely losing a lot of its purpose and has already been seen to be not churning out the most qualified candidates and i i think one of the things that you've really seen is um and again not getting into the specifics of it but you have these 
universities that have many, many, and disproportionately, um, disproportionately versus their population, their general population, many uh, Jewish alumni who I don't know the percentages for them, but give a lot of money to these universities. And then these universities, and again, I'm not sharing my own opinions, but the universities, they've seen those universities, including NYU, which is, you know, has a heavy, heavy Jewish influence being from New York City, that those universities are now coming out with official statements sometimes condemning Hamas and are, are condemning Israel in favor of Hamas right after these attacks. And regardless of what you think, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it, I think that that is going to be a shift. And there's lots of other things that the left has done and other things that, that have happened that I think are going to, uh, into the future, really, um, change the way that people think about things, things. But yeah, is there something about Franz Boaz? I don't know. Probably. Well, I mean, it'd be I, embarrassing I, I, because he's, <laughs> Well, uh, I not to go too far into it, but I there his ideas of sort of the the cultural relativism that I mean he's the first guy that really gets big onto the aspect of you know calling out scientific racism and things like that. There is of course I did you not can't know that. you can't separate him from sort of the uh, sort of the ethnic animosities between sort of the the Jew, uh, sort of Jewish and German academics at the time right before World War II starts off. I mean he dies in 1942, but his legacy lives oh. on. And in post, and I mean, plus there's a lot of falsified data around him. There's a lot of issues that are controversial, but people can't talk about them for a variety of reasons. But I, yeah. I think one one big issue is that you see after the end of the war is is that there in America there there's a lot of studies that prove this in surveys that detail sort of the issue of um, more white Anglo-Saxon Protestant sort of the WASP definitions or more Protestant European individuals hold more to a, a classical understanding of say like race and anthropology or more Catholic and Jewish anthropologists are more open to sort of blank slate cultural relativist understandings of things. And that's been a huge part of why the Academy on anthropology has been such an issue. Um, and I think that that's a really important thing to discuss in, in looking into him and looking into sort of why do we have this sort of blank slate. And it really sets up the formation of, for me, at least a political egalitarianism where, oh, well, actually, no, he's the same as me. And we know that that's not true because, uh, you know, we'll say, oh, well, this is a social construct. A leftist will say, well, I'm sorry that you're social construct doesn't match your child's bone marrow or whatever. Like it, it's a convenient way to ignore biological reality. Mm -hmm. And this is why the modern left today, they can acknowledge it, but they have to acknowledge it in a way that doesn't say the obvious out loud. This is why the Twitter poster Kobefe and on has one of the best, you know, sayings ever that the woke are more correct than the mainstream. Because when, when he says that he means that actually, you know, the progressives do have a pretty, hbd oriented understanding of how like race relations work or how society works they can't say it in the way that you know a rightist would because they're not you know they're not wired like we are they're wired in a way that acknowledges these things are true but they have to have nice linguistic um you know circumnavigating these like forbidden issues uh yeah. and, and that's a big deal to to consider and i mean like that he's a big part of like sort of the reason why this anthropology has gone the way it has so leftward especially post-world war ii as stone age herbalist has talked about in your interview with him because once you start deviating away from classical understandings of how peoples are formed i mean i've been covering joseph de maestro with orrin mcintyre and he's very adamant you know joseph de maestro about well once you bring people in to assimilate and once you start making laws you're abdicating power but you're also saying whatever was originally there is going to be diluted and less off than what it used to be before. And that would make Joseph de Meister sound like a hardcore racist or an ethnic nationalist in 2023. But he's pointing out things that even um, Plato pointed out in the Republic. And so to this is my big issue about anthropology. And it's a big reason why I think a lot of people who study it or might call themselves on the right, and this isn't a dig at you, this is just a general observation, that when these individuals, you know, th they use those terms, that's why that knee jerk, like alarm bell goes off in their brain. Like, wait a second, I've heard this crap before and I know it's not true because we've seen a, a significant departure in the 20th century from, from antiquity to probably 1930s, uh, a substantial departure from classical understandings of how peoples, how our understanding of history um, and it, it's kind of funny that, you know, when we, now that we have more genetic studies, we can understand like actually, oh no, these ancient mythos, these ancient stories 
and even earlier Victorian age anthropology is, you know, there's a lot of backing to their to their case studies here. And I think that that's really important yeah. to look at. And that's and that's something that comes up a lot in cultural anthropology, specifically that uh, these stories, uh, stories, stories like from Herodotus or, or Plato do have truth in them. Um, they are also applied to uh, indigenous oral traditions that often also have truth in them. Not only truth in how the society functions, and I think someone in the comments had brought up Thrawn earlier. Yeah, obviously Thrawn is my favorite character in Star Wars because he's essentially <laughs> a cultural anthropologist mastermind uh, commander. Yeah, so he's number one. But um, he's right in a lot of ways. I mean, it's it's uh, Thrawn is correct both in uh, all of his actions and in his view of the world. When started talking about Star Wars and I lost my train of thought. Departure <laughs> from the classics. Yeah, so there the the power of metaphor is extraordinarily important. And human stories, the stories that people tell in their culture, they tell a lot about the values of that culture and of that time. So I I did an episode for Illegitimate Scholar, the podcast on uh stories. It was like in the in the 20s or something. It was about symbols and or no, there was another one on symbols, but there was one on stories and why they matter. And I've talked a number of different times about why Disney stories matter. I even did a, a literary or not literary, but I compared like the Mulan of like the 90s versus the Mulan of today versus the Mulan from the Xiongnu, which were a nomadic people in in northern north of China in like the 400s and how it was adopted into Han, um, or maybe it was the Xi'an Bai, regardless. Um, they, uh, the stories are important and the stories will change over time, but they will hold truth inside them. And more importantly, the metaphors and what will really change in the story is the metaphors of what they, what they tell the people in their society to live in. And the departure from studying the classics in the United States and the West in general is probably the biggest change and this is something that had been done by any by any scholar for the last 2000 years since there was antiquity is that people would be studying the classics and regardless of which institutions rose and fell whether it was monasteries whether it was islamic or european universities they were all studying the classics all of them they were they were all studying like there was different works that they were studying, but there was overlap of the works that they were studying. They would have been reading Herodotus, Plato, Aristotle. Um, they would have been reading them, all of them. And uh, the departure from from those, from that common thread of uh, ways of understanding the world and the reverence that came with it comes with a loss of the ways that reading and consuming the metaphors inherent in those writings would change your understanding of the world and a departure from from those in our education system it changes the education system even if you keep all the other factors constant does that make sense yeah absolutely i mean the the value of a classical education can't be under, uh, understated i mean it's been almost a century almost a hundred years since we've had a president of the united states that understood latin or greek or both and it's been i think a significant departure from our our own understanding of how the world operates and i think that that's a a really significant issue and and i mean if it weren't um if it weren't for my own you know christian faith i don't know if i would be as interested in greek and latin as i once was uh, you know i took latin in college because i didn't want to take spanish i didn't want to take a, a different language i was working in the legal field i thought latin would be useful and i mean it's kicks my ass. I mean, uh, those, I mean, C's get degrees in that instance, but Latin was a very difficult uh, language to really get a grasp of. And it's so s strange and sad because so much of my language is, is, you know, based on sort of Latin and Germanic and others as an English, you know, someone who speaks the, the modern English language. And uh, I felt so disconnected and there was a real sense of like, wow, you know, this used to be taught everywhere. And now I've I'm in a I'm in a class of guys that thought this was a blow off class and every no one really passed that class outside of some C's and B's. And it really does indicate that there's been a, a departure from the classical education and that, that you need that because if you don't have a a worldly understanding and you can only look through things through a very specific politically demonic, you know, not demonic, maybe demonic, but a politically dominant lens, which is the left in the United States, then, yeah, you're not going to have a good understanding of the world. I mean, 
I'm really glad I got to travel as a kid, as an army brat, to, to see most of Europe and to appreciate Europe for what it is and what it was and its antiquity and its age. And to, be, to go to Cologne, right? And you, right next to you, you have this giant Gothic cathedral. And then, you know, 20 yards from it is a Roman museum where, you know, the, the Romans were colonizing the area and had settlements. And you could see what their houses looked like, what their graves looked like, what they believed in, what they wrote to one another. And, you know, that's something that you can't find in America. And that's always given me a great appreciation towards my, you know, our, our friends across the pond because they've got something older than us. And uh, we, we really should learn from them, I think, in a lot of respects to appreciate a, a more worldly uh, perspective on politics and on culture. Because, I mean, our founders, you know, some want to call them proto-libs, some want to call them, you know, enlightenment morons or whatever. But I mean... Those guys looked to the Greeks, they looked to the Romans, they looked to the, you know, the medieval Swiss republics, they looked for every answer they could to understand, how are we going to build a government, you know, and to me, you're going to need to look towards the classics again, in order to be looking towards the future. I, I like Charles Haywood's idea of a, a politics of future past, like you need to understand antiquity to, to build the future. And so many of us are just so divorced from antiquity to to even to even have people talking about it is a good thing and more people should i mean right. um you know you and stone age herbalist and ed dutton and others you know looking at sort of these studies and looking at what does the data actually say prior to the 20th century is important to to, to look at um yeah uh, i mean what, what about the classics to you stands out or, or what specific culture you know have you learned about or been reading about that uh, sticks out to you in these instances well, there's obviously a bunch, um, and and there's there's different examples in in different times that are good. But I think like you know the the Roman history, and especially with how long it is between the Republic and then to the uh, to the Empire, and and all the different political shifts that happen inside of it. Um, but the one specific thing, if I could share one thing, it would be the. Um, the cultural idea within this might have been the Athenian city state, or it might have been Rome, but the idea stands regardless is that there was a cultural idea that giving money that, uh, that paying your taxes, that giving your money to the state as a rich guy was something that increased your status within that culture. And that I know that that's a very minor thing. That's a very simple thing. And there's lots of other systems in the world that that had that. But just that simple idea that there was redistribution from the top into the state, which was actually being used to help individuals. I, th I think that that incentivization that's built into the cultural traditions of a place, especially within their elite is something that is more important than anything else because when the when the incentives for the elite in a society are aligned with the incentives for the other people in that society that's that's when you find balance and i often look to ancient civilizations as well when i say ancient i mean pre-ancient i mean primitive civilizations um or not even civilizations but you know band level or um band level tribe level peoples one of the things that is very common is redistribution by big men who are leaders that lead through their just their simple um just simply that people will follow them and often that has to do with redistribution of wealth and this is something that comes up in a lot of different civilizations but th but that is one individual thing but to go more big picture when i'm thinking about the classics it's there's two I, there's two main ideas in that number one is that they 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 stayed for so long that their use has to be important in some way that the fact that they were that that they were respected by so many people of so much prominence in so many different ages shows their tenacity and and is you know that's enough evidence of them being worthwhile on their own but there's also the idea and and this comes into more rather than dissonant anthropology, it goes more into alternative anthropology and archaeology, is the idea of a lost civilization prior to the, um, and this is like Graham Hancock, Jimmy Corsetti type stuff. But there is a lot of evidence there 
or there being a civilization prior to the uh, the Greeks and the Romans, but that the Greeks and the Romans and the Babylonians and the Egyptians and other ancient cultures did retain knowledge of these prior human civilizations within their own writings. And so if you read those writings and you and you subscribe to that idea, then you are retaining a little piece of that knowledge that's from that pre-civilization. So I once again said a lot of different things, and I'm not sure if I answered your question. Well, I think that there's always secrets to be learned from the ancients. And uh, for us, I think that are more, you know, European in our ancestry, I think it's always important to look back towards you know, what made them who they were and how those people acted. I think one question I do want to ask you, and this might be a great place to sort of uh, wrap up for today, would be a lot of people on the right, myself included, have a, a, a special place in our hearts for Oswald Spangler's two volumes of Decline of the West and sort of a, a cyclical understanding of history that, you know, great men do come, uh, civilizations are organic. They do eventually die off. We, you know, we, they have lifespans. They will eventually sort of freeze and crystallize and their, their ages of innovation and exploration might die out. And then there are others that are more um, Habermas and Kolosek. They're far more interested in sort of conceptual history, um, you know, and they, they kind of spat quite often with those that are more Spenglerian. But you know, in your viewpoint, you know, looking at cultural anthropology, looking at the history of peoples and civilizations, uh, is there a case to be made for the, the the sort of Spangler cycles of history, you know, the spring, the, the autumn, the fall and summer? Do you, do you see that there is evidence that sort of backs up the claim? Or is there a different understanding of history that maybe individuals on the right should look towards rather than you know, the 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 meme that a lot of people will post of, of Oswald Spangler's face and I'll have the, the Drake album logo. You know, if you're reading this, it's too late. Uh, you know, how, how do you how, how do you approach, say, the more cyclical forms of history and what might be a different way to look at it? So I um, so I, it's it's embarrassing to say this, but I actually haven't read Spangler's and I've read a lot of books and those are not um, that's not one of them. Uh, but I had like a lot of people I know have read Spangler and I actually I, I I do agree with that idea as long as I'm understanding it. I think that human social constructions like different empires, different governments, different ideas, they tend to uh, mirror human life cycles. So in the sense that they will they will grow up and they'll like explode, you know, they'll they'll take form based on, you know, a combination of, in the case of an actual human, the DNA of two individual people that has plenty of other influences from thousands of people generations back. And then something new is created and it's based on its new environment. Islam, I think, is a perfect example because with something like Islam, uh, it explodes out of this cultural backbone of uh, Arab Bedouinism, of nomadism, of trading. It has characteristics of that. And then it metastasizes and atrophies over time um, and, and this can happen with, it, it can have a time of crisis and a golden age, any of them, not just in Islam, can have a golden age, it can atrophy, it can kind of decline, and then there can be a rebirth of something. So like, it, this happens in a lot of places. But what tends to happen is the social constructions that are created in a government, they are formed for a certain social construct, and they're generally created out of some other system. There's some significant reform. The American Revolution, for example, the rules and the laws come out of this situation where you have this Anglo diaspora country, which is on the frontier, um, you know, boats, all of this, so all of this cultural context goes into how the laws are created. It's influenced by these classics that we were talking about by uh, Greeks, by English common law, by the Magna Carta, by, um, by the War of 1812, the War of 1812. That's no, the the War of 1215, the Magna Carta. It's influenced by the Magna Carta. It's influenced by uh, the Haudenosaunee's Great Law of Peace. It's influenced by the ideas of all these different places, and it comes to create something new. And it and it's created in that social, in that cultural context. And it's created with an ability to bend but not break. It's made with the idea that it should and can shift over time with amendments to the Constitution and with laws being made by the judicial branch. But it's not made to be so weak 
that it can't do its job, that it can't, um, that it can't change with changing situations. Um, and those, sometimes those social institutions, they become entrenched in power in the society and there becomes to be a lot of waste and rent seeking in society. And the situation, the environment, both human and physical, of the time has changed to the point where the social constructs are no longer serving their purpose for the people as a whole. They're meant for a different time and that time has passed and it's incapable of changing. And in that case, in human history, most of the times, the, the really, these would either erupt out of peasant revolts or some sort of other no, noble, revolt, noble revolt that would change that society and they would create something new. Or you would have a lot of times a step a, a, a step civilization, the Golden Horde, Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, all these different people over hundreds of years, over thousands of years in different places would almost be like a cleansing, purifying force to destroy what's currently there. And then there's something new that's built up within the context of what's left behind as, as they've been destroyed. Um, so generally, yes, I, I view that. I view it like that. And I, I, in a situation where they're, they are no longer um, where a social construct, where a government is no longer serving its purpose, you know, barring any sort of outside influence, it's going to implode on itself and it's going to create something new. But whatever is created, just like Shia Islam being created in Persia out of uh, with heavy Zoroastrian and Persian influences, you're going to have the influences of whatever came before and in, in different variations, depending on who exactly crafts it and what they do. But you're going to have something that's based on that old cultural context. And that's why trail railroad tracks in America are based on the uh, the Roman Roman carts, you know, stuff like that, that like these things, these these ideas of the past are hidden. They might not be named the way that they are, but they still exist in our culture and they're unnamed. Uh, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. And whether something is named as Roman or whether something is named as anything, it doesn't mean that it is or is not that thing. Um, if that makes sense. That yeah, no, I, I definitely see where you're, you're, you're coming from. I, I do think that their civilization is as organic as its people. I, to me, I've always viewed that civilization is as healthy as its people. I think this is why when you look at a society that is, you know, two thirds of the country's overweight or obese, you know, for, over like almost half of white women um, over the age of 45 or on SSRIs, you know, a long, a large portion of the country has some uh, is on prescription drugs. And most people are not as active or as working out as they are. Like you see a civilization that is in desperate need of help or is in on the outs. And so I think that you know, the organic side of that understanding of civilization is very important. Um, so the last thing I do want to sort of clock in here, of course, is the issue of, um, not an issue, but uh, Mr. Uh, Go Kane, uh, Trillison just says $5 US over on Entropy. He says, hey, well, hello, good sir. Greatly appreciate it. Um, but with that being said, Mr. Uh, Mr. Illegitimate Scholar, where can people find you and your work? Yeah, so um, I've been putting out a lot of YouTube content, a lot of streams recently, but um, most of my content is on the uh, audio. My best content is on audio, and those full episodes are on YouTube as well. But that's Illegitimate Scholar on Spotify, um, Apple, all podcasting sites, Ill underscore Scholar on Twitter, and the YouTube page is going to have more stuff on it going forward. Join me on Discord, um, and I'm on Patreon as well with uncensored and a little bit longer episodes. Uh, so yeah, please, if you liked what you heard today, it's it's more questions like this on the Illegitimate Scholar podcast. Well, I have your, your pod links as well as your YouTube account down below in the description. I will, I'll I'll add your Twitter to it as well. Um, but Mr. Scholar, thank you so much for your time. And as for my audience, uh, we will have a new video out on Thursday. I was going to originally have it as a scripted, unscripted real talk, but then I decided to just start writing and we'll have a new uh, video, longer essay out this, uh, this week. So until then, I will see you all next time, ladies and gents. Take care and God bless.